mind of Elon Musk and others who have, uh, they have a vested interest in sophisticated AI, and those that have an, a vested interest are the ones that you find when you start investigating and doing research that have been warning the most for the last four years at least about an existential threat. And here I'm going to give you just a bit of a preview of like one segment that gives you why I think that Elon Musk and Bill Gates and Stephen Hawking before his passing, they were all warning that we are facing the elimination of humanity by the direction that we are now going with AI. And here is an example. On the border between North Korea and South Korea, through the, I believe Halliburton was the original creator, they have, I'm going to say, security guards. But the security guards are heavy-duty, mobile robots. Those robots... All of them, and they and it's a classified top secret in both the U.S. and in South Korea about how many are there, which means there are a lot. And I have video in my presentation of these uh, machines at work, and this uh, is a fact. They have been made to be 100% autonomous. There is no human interface between the decision of these robotic security guards on the Korean borders, uh, except the algorithms built into the robots. That means they can kill on any instant, depending upon what the algorithms are feeding into the the mechanical metallic robot as what significant threat. And I do know from a whistleblower uh, from this past summer that there have been at least, there's been at least one disastrous consequence of trying to build military soldiers in a robot lab in which the robots, for reasons that have never been understood, they went rogue uh, against their makers and killed some human beings. Yeah, and you're that's, not going to hear about this in the New York Times. No, but there is a there's a story on Unknown Country of, of, about a week ago, I believe, folks, about a, a petition that is uh, signed by a whole lot of people around the world urging a South Korean university to stop this type of research for that very reason. It's really very scary. It is. Very. Well, that's going to be an exciting presentation, Linda. For my part, I'm going to be talking about Afterlife Revolution in my main presentation, my free presentation, I should say, and all the things that have happened since the book was written. And it is an ongoing, astonishing, and beautiful thing. Annie is really good at being in the afterlife, as you will see. But then, in and I want to segue from what I'm about to say into our discussion, I'm going to be talking in my uh, lecture about close encounter experiences that I have been having recently. As we are recording this on uh, the 5th of April, night before last is the last direct encounter I had to give you an idea, folks, of how intense this is. And this is will be my second discussion, because to be very honest with you, I have gotten into uh, use of my implant, and it is now a huge part of my life. And I'm not, a, absolutely wouldn't say for a minute that the implant doesn't also use me, but nevertheless, I can use it. And I, I'm going to tell about all of what I've learned from doing that in the in the uh, in the second lecture at Contact. Contact in the desert is June one to three in Indian Wells, California, and it's going to be a really extraordinary show. It's always a great show, and uh, I think you could s certainly 
you'll meet me and Linda there if nobody else, for sure. In any case, Linda, let's segue now into uh, directly into the show. But before we do that, I want to stop just briefly for our free Dreamlanders, which I hate to do, but uh, we've got to get you involved in this one way or another. And so listen up to these commercials. I want everyone to know that as we ramp up our new website, Linda is going to be returning to Dreamland on a regular basis with bi-monthly Linda Moulton Howe reports, just like the old days. And believe me, they'll be even more exciting because things have gotten a lot more intense. Contact in the desert. This year, the magic happens from June 1 to 3 in a brand new venue in Indian Wells, California. Whitley Strieber will be there telling the joyous story of the afterlife revolution and all that has happened with Anne since the book was published. Then in his second lecture, he's going to be talking about close encounter experiences that are happening to him right now. He reports that there are more of these experiences in his life than ever before. But what are they? What do they mean? He will bring a completely new insight and a completely new vision of this powerful experience. Contact in the Desert features such superstars as George Nori, George Sukalos, Linda Moulton Howe, Freddie Silva, Nick Pope, James Gilliland, Peter Lavenda, Travis Walton, and many more. Don't miss this incredible weekend of enlightenment and discovery. Go to contactinthedesert.com and sign up today. Whitley Strieber's nonfiction is magical, powerful, and thought-provoking. From communion to the afterlife revolution, there is no body of work like it in the world. Nothing even approaches it. And not only that, his wonderful fiction, from The Wolfen to his latest novel, New, offers reading and listening entertainment that you will never forget. And where do you find all this in one place? At Strieber.com. That's where... Every Whitley Strieber book available for sale is there, as well as a pre-order link for new. So don't wait. Go to Strieber.com and start exploring. There's only one Whitley and only one place to find all his work. Strieber.com. This is Whitley Strieber. I'm talking to Linda Moulton Howe. Her website, her beautiful new website, earthfiles.com. Com. Do visit. It's a whole new experience on earthfiles.com. Linda, just before we left the air for a few minutes, I was getting ready to ask you about a very fundamental question. Two things are happening right now, or really three things. First, there has been, and no matter what they say about it, there has, in fact, been release of real UFO footage from official sources within the United States government via the Washington Post and the New York Times. And a lot of people have a lot of things to say, and I'm not entirely sure all of those people are completely on the up and up uh, about their opinions because that's the raw fact, number one. Number two, there is a lot of UFO activity beginning to be reported from credible sources, which is consequent to those releases. In other words, pilots and so forth are beginning to report this. Number three, I am not alone in having the visitors come very much closer than they have been in years. They are really, as I would say in my life personally, they are closer than they have ever been since the few weeks after the communion experience, there was a hiatus and then a few weeks uh, and I realized and started going out into the woods that they were there and that that became a very intense period. And this period is equally intense. Now we have a huge public on this planet that is completely unprepared in the, uh, uh, advanced societies, they have been taught and carefully taught to laugh all of this off. What's going to happen when this huge, unprepared population uh, suddenly has to face this reality? That's exactly the question that I have myself been trying to communicate with the public and some of the private people that I have met behind the scenes 
that when you have policies of denial and lies for 70 years, and the political system, the military system, and the intel system become as curdled and corrupt as they seem to be now, it is partly explained by something that Robert Bigelow, the owner of Bigelow Aerospace in Las Vegas, Nevada, said uh, just uh, only a few, gosh, it was around the time of the release in the New York Times and the Washington Post of the uh, UFO gun camera footage. And what he said was that all Americans are being held back from serious research into UFOs by a juvenile taboo, close, 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 close. It's and so I, true. I took that, a juvenile taboo, and I did a, a report at her files, the juvenile taboo against telling truths about an alien presence. And I have had so much feedback on this report from people who are working in science, government, and military who resonate with the whole concept that we are trying to get around, over, and destroy a juvenile taboo that UFOs, ETs, other life in the universe should be something that is held over people's heads. They are threatened their lives, their pensions. It's been going on since World War II. This is insane. And that in the beginning, I've always said, I could imagine somebody, whether it was a president or the secretary of defense or even an ambassador, who went on worldwide uh, television by satellite and simply made this point. We are here to apologize to you today for having a policy of denial, which essentially were lies for 70 years since World War II, because when we first encountered what people then called UFOs, and today we call unidentified aerial phenomena, we were afraid that it could be aggressive, it could be here to take over the planet, it could be here to insert something that we could not control. And therefore... We clamped down, and it was to be removed. There was to be no bridge to the public and the media. And unfortunately, that kept going on year by year, decade by decade, because it has taken us 70 years to get to a point where we can stand in front of the world today and say, there is no aggressive threat. And we are here to tell you we have allies, and that the universe is also built with enemies. The dark and the light, just like the yin and the yang, are here. But we can assure you that on planet Earth, we have friendlies who are trying to help us, and we are trying now to grow up to the phenomena, and we can't do it unless we have every one of you on planet Earth going along on this journey in which we're going to finally meet publicly with one or more other intelligences from this cosmos, and nobody needs to be afraid, nothing needs to be to change except that you all need to know, and in knowing, then you're going to help us understand what is happening wherever it happens on this planet, because we would like to encourage people now to stand up to report no one will be criticized. And if somebody did something like that, I swear, 75% of the planet is already there. Absolutely. That's absolutely correct. And, you know, in my case, for example, I went from being incredibly terrified. I mean, I remember walking out in those woods. I could barely put one foot in front of the other. I was so scared. To where I am now, which they wake me up generally. I mean, my listeners know a uh, uh, that the initial wake ups after Annie passed away were pretty intense. You know, they electrocuted my toes and pinched my nipples and went on and got, they got my attention. Now it's just a gentle, usually a the blow in my face or something to wake me up. If I'm not already awake, cause I usually wake up at the meditation time at three o'clock in the morning anyway. But if I don't, they will generally wake me up. And I go in and I sit down and I open myself to this. The implant turns on and then I can use it. 
and it is so sophisticated. It's extraordinary. Well, but when, it's when a very friendly the experience. Music, There's it, nothing hostile about it at all. Yeah, did Annie teach you to do it, or did the uh, the, the gray types that you're working with? No, no, Who not the gray. It? It's not the grays. There's something else here. They're, they're dark blue. I've and uh, I think they showed up. You know, you remember if you remember communion years ago. I describe them as the good army, and they sort of seem to come with the grays. And if you read the communion letters, you'll see uh, occasional mention of these sort of dark blue dwarf-like workers who are there with the grays. And that's who I'm with now. And I, I, if I look back across my life, that's really who I've been with most of my life. And uh, they're, it, they're really deep friends, and I think that my wife is involved with them. In fact, I'm sure she is. In fact, uh, if now she's got her own good army, <laughs> I think. <laughs> well, but, I have an il illustration of exactly what you're describing in my Glimpses Volume 1 book, Facts and Eyewitnesses, and it is in the taxonomy that I did at the back of the book, all in color. And I'm familiar with it, that, uh, and that's, that's it. That's what I see. Yeah, and it was uh, New Hope, Pennsylvania, and that this was a, a person who saw these three and a half to four foot tall navy blue outfits on, and uh, there were three or four of them in a line, and that is what you're describing. Yeah, and they often show up in lines too. Yeah, yeah, it's so strange, and um, and and it's really quite wonderful. But now let's let's talk about a little bit about. We both know a, more than we can unfortunately say about what goes on on the inside of this thing. And uh, one of the things that does go on is this absolutely rock-ribbed belief in this being a hostile presence. And there is there a hostile element, Linda? We're going to take another break for our okay. free Dreamlanders before you answer that question. We'll be right back, free Dreamlanders. Ever wonder what the close encounter experience is all about? Think you know what it's about? When you open Whitley and Ann Streber's Immortal Communion Letters, you're going to experience a whole new vision. Not something being told to us by researchers and theorists but the actual testimony of people who came face to face with this unknown. Unforgettable. And the book is only three ninety nine at Streber.com. Contact in the desert. This year, the magic happens from June 1 to 3 in a brand new venue in Indian Wells, California. Whitley Streber will be there telling the joyous story of the afterlife revolution and all that has happened with Anne since the book was published. Then in his second lecture, He's going to be talking about close encounter experiences that are happening to him right now. He reports that there are more of these experiences in his life than ever before. But what are they? What do they mean? He will bring a completely new insight and a completely new vision of this powerful experience. Contact in the Desert features such superstars as George Nouri, George Sukalos, Linda Moulton Howe, Freddie Silva, Nick Pope, James Gilliland, Peter Lavenda, Travis Walton, and many more. Don't miss this incredible weekend of enlightenment and discovery. Go to contactinthedesert.com and sign up today. We're back talking to Linda Moulton Howe, and before we left the air, I asked the question, is there any hostile intent here? I have from two solid sources over since the beginning of the 90s anyway, had uh, this sentence and another I'll give you in a minute, but the, this is a sentence that was sent to me in a floppy disk by men that were introduced to me, one working for the Defense Intelligence Agency, the other working for the Central Intelligence Agency. No, that was uh, National Security Agency. CIA was another one. Uh, this was NSA and C and uh, DIA, that's who these two men were. And in my uh, book, Glimpses Volume 2, I refer to them as the writers. And all of this came about through Ray Boucher, who has worked for the University of Nebraska uh, in their Department of Graphic Illustration. He's very grounded, down-to-earth man. I have known him since at least around 1984. We were 
both investigating RAF Bentwaters Woodbridge and another parallel track in Ray's life has been to be a minister in one of the uh, Protestant churches in Lincoln, Nebraska. And he has always had those two lives wedded together. And in the early 1990s, Ray began to do research and write about eschatology. Eschatology is the end of the world, quote-unquote, coming through something like apocalyptic uh, senses that are described in the apocalypse in the Bible. And that is the context in which Ray was working when he was first approached by the Defense Intelligence Agency and the National Security Agency analyst. And they wanted to ask, they asked Ray, can you get in touch with Linda Moulton Howe? We would like to be able to communicate with her, and we would like to have uh, her book, uh, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volumes 1 and 2, And they had apparently been exposed to them, but they asked Ray specifically, and he said he would get in touch with me. And this is what led to a dialogue at that time in around 1993 to 94, where if people listening had computers back then, we only had these little three-inch floppy disks, and they would only take a little bit of information. But that is how we began communicating. Uh, They would send me a floppy disk, I would get it uh, printed out, and then I would respond in kind, and this is what I published in Glimpse's uh, Volume 2 as my whole saga with the writers. And in one of their communications with me, they said that our government had a category for at least one of the main intelligences dealing with Earth, NHEs, uh, non-human entities, and in other categories, the NHEs, there was a group that they referred to as HA, these hostile alien visitors. And in one of the communications they said about the hostile alien visitors. They are neither benign nor neutral, but their interface with human life is deception. Now, I Which is certainly a, a big part of it. Exactly. Now, what's, why it's important to keep this Uh, as a context for what I'm going to say next, is Ray Boucher and and I both know that these two men are exactly who they said they were. They showed Ray right from the beginning uh, their ID badges and some other things, and that they felt, he said, they felt that it was important to try to reach out to somebody like me who had done Glimpses Volume 1 and 2 They felt that the, and and this is important, they felt that I was not going off half-cocked in any direction, but that I was really trying to report facts. And that's the best definition of my work and life that I could possibly share. That is my goal. And that if those books come across as, this is an honest journalistic effort, to lay out what is happening to humans and the abduction syndrome, the fact that there are animal mutilations and law enforcement knows that it's coming from something that can travel in discs and beams, and then there are the people who have been healed in an abduction. Many people have been healed, healed of cancer or uh, healed of crippling. So you've got an entire landscape that is complex, contradictory, and many times paradoxical. And that's why most people, when they really actually start trying to get to the bottom of what could have happened in this case, this case, this case, they get so turned upside down by the contradictions that they leave or they walk away or they don't want to have anything to do with it. And you and I and a few others are stubborn, I guess. I have never wanted to walk away. I have only wanted to understand. 
And the writers are a big, big node in my life because Ray saw their IDs and we knew we were dealing with real government people. Now, uh, there's two sides to that. There are some people who work for agencies who seek me out and seek others because they really, really want to download some information to get back some information because they are desperate for reality checks. They are desperate to understand the contradictions and the confusions themselves. There is the other side, which is that there are people who come from counterintelligence, which is highly sophisticated in this country, and they are taught, educated, and skilled at how to manipulate any voice, any print, any broadcast, any film in a way that suits some request that they have gotten from CIA, DIA, NSA, or whoever they are under. Now, when you are confronted with those two options, in the case of the writers, because of the long dialogue that I had, because I was able to go down to the University of Pennsylvania and get extremely rare books on what was called loan only, never to be taken out of the University of Pennsylvania. But these were guides from these men uh, trying to uh, broaden my perspective on the possibility that in addition to benign and harmless entities involved with our planet, that there were hostile alien visitors, that you have to carry both as a possibility and perhaps as a reality If you can carry both in your mind, then you get closer to being able to handle this difficult, bumpy, razor blade landscape. And (laughs) I'm not saying this to scare anybody. I am still alive. I hope my my existence, you're alive. Very much Um, alive and very much engaged. I mean, I'm doing it. With right. and and uh, nobody has carried me off to perdition yet. Well, that doesn't mean they haven't go. tried, and that that does not mean that there isn't a major hostile aspect to this because there is. And on that yeah. note, and we're I going to wait, to Linda. I have to. I have to do a break. I, can. I have to do a break. Okay. <laughs> we have to stop for a second. I hate to do it. And free Dreamlanders, we're going. You're going to stay with us because until the new site is up. Uh, we're going to be uh, th- letting the whole full hour of Dreamland go out o- over both feeds because you can't subscribe right now. And I wish you could, but you can't. If the full site is up by some miracle by the time you are listening to this, please enjoy the show and also do subscribe. As Linda intimated earlier, moving these big old websites from one type of server to another, one type of uh, uh, system to another is a slow, difficult process. Free Dreamlanders will be right back. Contact in the desert. This year, the magic happens from June 1 to 3 in a brand new venue in Indian Wells, California. Whitley Strieber will be there telling the joyous story of the afterlife revolution and all that has happened with Anne since the book was published. Then in his second lecture, He's going to be talking about close encounter experiences that are happening to him right now. He reports that there are more of these experiences in his life than ever before. But what are they? What do they mean? He will bring a completely new insight and a completely new vision of this powerful experience. Contact in the Desert features such superstars as George Nori, George Sukalos, Linda Moulton Howe, Freddie Silva, Nick Pope, James Gilliland, Peter Lavenda, Travis Walton, and many more. Don't miss this incredible weekend of enlightenment and discovery. Go to contactinthedesert.com and sign up today. The Afterlife Revolution is getting great reviews. There's a tremendous, lovely response to it, and I'm so pleased and humbled because it's an effort on the part of myself and Anne. And I love Anne so much, I want her to succeed in this incredible task that she has undertaken of returning and communicating across the bridge between the worlds. And she's really doing it. It is, this is a real thing that's happening. Listen to some of these reviews. 
Anne and Whitley Strieber lay out their life's work in the most exquisitely beautiful manner. This moving book comes from the heart, the unified heart of two people who have dedicated their lives in this realm and the next to revealing the nature of consciousness as it makes its sojourn in this human form. That's just one. Here's another. I love, love this book. It's a wonderful read, especially if you lost somebody very close to you. Just incredible. Here's another one. The book shows you how to grow your soul, for lack of a better turn. Through Anne's insight, Whitley shares invaluable information that could only be from the other side. So take it seriously. Go to Amazon and get Afterlife Revolution. Go on to Amazon and get the Afterlife Revolution in paperback or in Kindle format. And if you have questions or thoughts... Write me at Whitley at Strever.com. I'm right here. I'm ready to answer anything you ask to help you in any way I can, always. We're talking to Linda Moulton Howe. Her website, earthfiles.com, beautiful new website. And Linda, we are going to both be at Contact in the Desert, June 1 to 3, in uh, Des uh, Indian Wells, California, in the uh, hotel there. Go to contactinthedesert.com to find out more about it. Uh, we're both going to be giving numerous presentations. My main presentation is going to be on what is happening now in terms of my close encounter experience. Now, we both know very well, and in some senses the hard way, just how hostile this hostile aspect of it is. And for a person like me who literally has these beings coming into my life every few days and living in my life, I mean, this is my life. Am I safe, do you think? I wonder about this all the time. Well, the part that I wanted to add as sort of like uh if you thought of a dumbbell and it has a circle or a sphere on one end and then it has a column in between and it has another sphere, I'm adding another sphere to what I just said before the break in this regard, which helps, I think, balance out uh, fear. And I have uh, used the information I'm now going to share for my own self to always try to keep me balanced because some days it seems like everything is so dark and another day light and it, the mixture of the two can be confusing. Now what I'm going to is Lynn Buchanan was a remote viewer for the Defense Intelligence Agency at the end of the 80s and he worked at Fort Meade in a barracks that was designated by the DIA for a what was called Project Stargate, and the, there were about eight men, talented remote viewers, who were brought together to take on really official assignments for the CIA and the DIA, but Congress and the American public were never to know. They were gaining information and testing the reality of remote viewing while they were doing this, but they stayed in an old rundown barracks from World War II not very far from the shiny, big uh, na National Security Agency building, so that if anybody did say, do you know that there were remote viewers there and they were revealed, it would be like, well, we haven't spent much money. We have been trying to do reality checks on the quality of remote viewing, and they would be able to sit in front of a congressional investigation and say those words and mean it honestly. So that was the context of these men being put in this barracks. Now, Lynn was one of the very talented ones, Lynn Buchanan, and he has talked to me at great length about various taskings, and they don't know what they're remote viewing when they're in the process of doing it. They only can learn later with somebody who is overseeing what they are remote viewing and that they're usually, he said, what they did at DIA, there would be a three-by-five card with, let's say, a latitude-longitude, and that would be it, in a file cabinet that might have been on the fifth floor of the Pentagon, and they're over in Fort Meade. 
and nobody would have access to that three by five card. It would have been highly classified, and this was the way they kept the remote viewers. Uh, completely separated from the possibility of any knowledge about what they were tasked. And Lynn said, on one of his taskings, he realized that what he was dealing with were a lot of different non-humans. It became very clear to him. And he said, as I continued into the remote viewing, that what became obvious to me, almost like it was being drawn in my head, that there are friendlies, there are unfriendlies. And in those categories, there are friendlies that are telepathic and friendlies that are not telepathic. And there are unfriendlies that are telepathic and unfriendlies that are not telepathic. And that the difference between those four groups is how the DIA was categorizing the various types that we know that they are dealing with. And Lynn said, one of those hostiles, telepathic, extremely advanced, and this is Lynn's words, and they would like to see humanity annihilated, evaporated. Why? Okay. That's exactly. And when I've asked Lynn, I've asked a couple of other remote viewers, I've asked some of the whistleblowers, why are we of such a uh, hated by, let's say, maybe there's only three or four in the entire universe. Let's just be optimistic and say there are only three or four really hostile ones. And your question is exactly at the heart of what I think our government is trying to understand. Why would anything want to annihilate, evaporate the baby? I think of us as a baby species. Uh, We don't know much of anything, really. And the answer that Lynn came to said was, because we exist, thrive, and evolve on planet Earth, and that the hostiles have a vested interest in this solar system, this part of the Milky Way galaxy. There are territorial fights, and that right now our sun, our solar system, our planet is under the jurisdiction of something that would be in the neutral or ally category, and that the hostiles can't do anything about But uh, he also, we talked about the whole Enlil Enki story in the Anunnaki. And he said, I think there is some truth to the idea or the concept that there has been so much cloning, hybridization, genetic manipulation throughout this universe. It's happened on our planet over and over and over again. And that there are entities out there that do not want any of their genetic material in experimentation or, in our case, a species that has been evolving for a couple of million years on Earth. They don't want any of their genetic material to be in anything that is called human on Earth. Now, you can, again, it's like a Russian doll situation. Well, why, why would the idea that some advanced beings, genetic material, have been put inside of the genome of already evolving primates to keep creating smarter and and stronger beings, why would that be anathema to anything out there? And right, uh, and Whitley, whatever insight you have on that question, I would love to hear. (laughs) Well, I was just going to ask you the same thing. It's mysterious to me, and it seems like a kind of xenophobia. It also, though, may have to do with something I have noticed about the visitors I am now with, and that is that they are not fundamentally physical entities, I don't think. They can manifest as physical, but they don't seem all that capable in the physical world. 
certainly not as free to move about in it as we are. Now, why that would be, there could be any number of explanations, but my best guess is we don't yet know and don't fully understand. In any case, if mixing with us genetically is possible for some, and it would weigh them down, in other words, it would make them more physical, they might really fear that. They might really fear it. I don't know that the ones I'm dealing with don't fear anything about me at all. I mean, in fact, they have a lot of fun. I, I recently, I encountered one of them at the Esalen Institute, and my uh, uh, friend was in actually sleeping in the same dorm room I was, and he had a brief vision of version of the experience also. And I saw this being's face very clearly for a, just a second or so, and then it diverted my attention away. Uh, because it's really hard to look in their eyes, harder, much harder than looking in the eyes of the greys, which I got used to doing, if those are eyes even. I'm not even sure they could be uh, dark glasses from another planet. <laughs> <In any case. laughs> or technology <laughs> through and through. Right. But these, these, this was like looking into the void itself. Huh. Then one afternoon, there is a certain signal they will give, and then I go into the meditation place in the inner posture that I take, uh, and lo and behold, one of them showed up wearing a pair of dark glasses with white frames, so I couldn't miss them. And it was like a joke, like to say, right. okay, if our eyes scare you, I'll wear glasses. Right. <laughs> and, you know, there's that kind of bubbly sort of sense of humor about the whole thing with them. They're not, they're very, very determined but and they they were strict. I mean, you know, I don't I don't sleep a full night ever. It, it I, no matter where I am or what I'm doing, not ever. And that's because this this three a.m. meditation is an essential ingredient of life for me now, for whatever reason. Whitley, why three a.m.? Oh, I can tell you precisely, but I don't want to get. It's, I don't want to uh, air out my stuff here. Uh, but I will just say, if you're curious, the reason is that uh, you give off a glow when you do this inner movement, and uh, you're easier to see at a time of day when there's less soul activity. In other words, most people are asleep, and you're, that one little glow is easier to find, apparently. Uh -huh. But anyway, but let's go back now to these larger questions. And what I want to bring up now is something that I've not heard anything about, but that's troubling me a lot. I have observed in the past, some of the visitors had a very definite machine-like aspect to them. And I thought to myself, as AI becomes more and more powerful, would it ally with off-world AI. Yeah. That worries me. Exactly. And uh, the uh, there's another part to this. Elon Musk was uh, speaking a year ago, I think it was in uh, June or July, to the National Governors Association, and that meeting was in Rhode Island. And in his discussion about artificial intelligence, which is what they were asking him about, he said, I don't think that most of people now are understanding that as we move forward, where in only 11 years from now, 20 to 30 percent of all trucking in the United States will be by robots. And in looking at what Elon Musk has been saying, uh, I was uh, looking at an uh, interview that he did for the National Governors Association back in Rhode Island uh, about a year ago in the summer of 2017. And he made this shocking statement. He said that within a decade, that it was expected that 20 to 30 percent of all trucking in the United States would be handled by robots, no humans. 
We have then a problem of what happens with employment, all of these people that will no longer be functioning in trucks, as well as so many other aspects of the world. It's coming at us faster than anybody realized. And as he said that, Elon Musk added these words, and I do not think that most people realize the robots will be smarter, faster, they will not have any sick days, they will do everything better than humans. And as we move into the rest of this century, Elon Musk warned, Unless we get on top of this right now, and I give us only four years to get control, that would be 17 to 2021, he said he warned that we are going to end up in an existential crisis, and he added this. He said the human body is fragile. It is too frail for space travel, and what is going to happen? is we are going to start building cyborgs, and the cyborgs will carry some of humanity at the level of mind, but the rest of the body will be from machines for space travel. And when you put all of that together, it doesn't take too much imagination to realize that we are right now on the cliff. We are at the edge And as he said, if in the next four years there is not some sort of international agreement about how to handle algorithms, that we can't take the human judgment out of what we're making in military and security, and that to go into space, if we're moving towards cyborgs that will not be so fragile, what guarantee will there ever be that those cyborgs in space and those robots in military won't turn against and ignore Homo sapiens sapiens. Well, there won't be any. If it's more efficient to ignore us, they will. But, you know, I what I have thought is that one of the things that has happened since the Enlightenment is that we have really pushed aside the whole idea of the soul. Uh, we were dominated by it for the whole center of the development of Western civilization during the religious dictatorship that's known as the Middle Ages. And then the Enlightenment finally came along and threw it off, but we threw the baby out with the bathwater because this is actually what we have that the machines can't acquire and why we are always on a separate and different plane. But if we reject that and don't believe it, and after all, Stephen Hawking died not believing it, and most of us, while we give it lip service, don't feel it in our guts. We can't feel our souls. We're soul blind. And I think that really makes us vulnerable, very vulnerable to the invasion of machine intelligence right into our own bodies. I, because Google, for example, is working hard to build machinery, essentially, that will fit the brain, that will involve, become part of the brain and bring silicon into the environment of carbon. We are carbon beings because we have we need free will in order to evolve our souls. Uh, carbon is if you if you take some silicon and some carbon, put them side by side, you can know exactly what I'm talking about. The carbon will be in a pile of free floating little particles. The silicon will be in sheets of crystals. The silicon can't change. It can't have free will. But that's why it makes such good machine intelligence. But if we end up replacing our carbon-based brains and all of their flexibility with better brains that are inflexible, we have ceased to be human. Exactly. You couldn't say it better. And this is why we are on some kind of a brink, an intersection. And depending upon which direction we go, and Elon Musk says only four years, uh, 17, 18 to 21, 22. And 
one of the reasons, apparently, he moved back his launch to Mars that he wants to do so badly from 26 uh, all the way back with the idea that he might be able to launch in 2022. And part of me says, what is it that is motivating Elon Musk to keep pushing back uh, these dates in order to get to Mars as fast as possible. And what keeps nagging at me is he has been read into the MJ-12 program, and there is something about whatever is coming that relates to other intelligences, something they know is returning or some cycle that is going to occur, that there is some kind of door closing and that this is part of Elon Musk racing to get to Mars. And does this relate in some way to ancient Greek gods and lore revisited? Oh, boy, I think so. Uh, A whistleblower two years ago, uh, this was before Tom DeLonge or any of uh, that emerged uh, publicly, in which Tom DeLong had talked to me also about ancient existences not being homo sapiens sapiens. Well, two years ago, a whistleblower told me it is an absolute fact our government knows that the Greeks and the Sumerians to back to the Anunnaki were all full blood, if you want to put it that way, extraterrestrial, meaning no... uh, no genetic hybridization uh, or mixture that the Greeks and the Anunnaki Sumerians were from someplace else, full body, blood with all of their mathematical genius on this planet, and that we have the humanoid form that we have because of those manipulations by very sophisticated, advanced humanoids. Well, The thing that then hooks into me as another one of the paradoxes and contradictions, you would think that if you are advanced and that you are an Aristotle, that you have the ability to know things about the universe and the mathematical configurations and the fractal rhythms of the universe and on and on, that those type of of beings and intelligences would never war with each other, that there would be no violence. And yet, we know from history, we know from cuneiform in clay stones that the Anunnaki Sumerians fought. Uh, There was all kinds of war. The Greeks championed uh, mythologies of Jupiter and Mars. Uh, There were always the pittings of one god, quote-unquote, against another god. Why would that be, Whitley, if they are advanced beings? Because they're not. That's why. It's as simple as that. And it's also, my guess is, why we don't see so much of them anymore. I think they've probably blown each other up. To those have, I mean, you look at the you look at the ancient Indian uh, descriptions of these wars, and my goodness, yeah. ferocious battles. And there are areas in the Middle East that are where there is glass fusion on the ground that suggests ultra high intensity explosions, like atomic explosions, took place there. And John Brandenburg did that book, Death on Mars, and comes uh, strictly from a nuclear physicist's point of view and And says there's 2.5 times the amount of xenon-129 in Mars' atmosphere compared to Earth post-1945 when we did an atomic explosion at White Sands. We dropped two bombs on Japan that Mars would have 2.5 times the amount of xenon-129, which can only exist post-atomic explosion or hydrogen bomb. Right. And that his whole thesis comes down to this particular conclusion, that based on the studies of what he has seen in the Cydonia region in the Northern Hemisphere, 
And that's where that uh, big uh, face carved a uh, mile, mile and a half long right. is. And that uh, based on what he's gotten calculations through NASA, NASA has not fought him on this. NASA seems to be encouraging John Brandenburg to do this research. And that uh, there are other nuclear-related uh, particles that uh, brought him to this conclusion that there were two hydrogen bomb explosions in the atmosphere to increase the power of the impact on the ground that would have smashed and flattened anything that was living on the surface below those two hydrogen bombs. And that he, uh, this is uh, what uh, John Brandenburg says, whoever gets to Mars as a human, they are going to be there on both an archaeological adventure and one in which they will be exhuming all kinds of bodies. Folks, I'm going to do a couple of things. One is, on this edition of Dreamland, when you go to the show page, description page, you'll be able to click on a link that will link you to all of our out there stories on Mars. And this will shock you as to how much evidence there is of a substantial presence of some kind on Mars. And some parts of it are very, very weird. Second thing is, if you are a subscriber, you can listen to John Brandenburg on Unknown Country. He, we've had some great interviews, and I believe you do too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. John is a remarkable man, and I want, we're just about to the end of our hour together. And I was going to ask Linda to stay on, but I don't have the heart. What you have not heard is her struggles with her allergies, with allergies. <laughs> right now. They're driving her crazy. Oh, the juniper. But I just, oh. She'll be back again soon, but I, I just want to tell you a very brief story. A woman said to me once or sent me a letter saying that she had been walking in the woods with her son in Tennessee and suddenly this little dark blue figure had come out of a cave and he said he was a rebel and he said there was a war between Earth and Mars a very long time ago and Earth won and lost the war. Earth won the war because it destroyed the entire biosphere of Mars, turning it into a desert. Earth lost the war because they captured our souls and condemned us to perpetual recycling through physical bodies, and they call this planet dead forever. Wow. Yeah. And there is something back there somewhere. I wouldn't take that story at face value, but there is something back there somewhere yeah. that does not add up. Yeah. What is your sort of final thought on that, Linda, before you go seal yourself yeah, off? I sneeze and sneeze. I think that most of us on planet Earth that are human have souls and that the souls recycle, and this is the only e-ticket out of this universe. And that for reasons that have something to do with the divine field, which is incomprehensible, there is a process that this universe has been created to, I'm going to say, allow. And that is that there are entities in this universe on purpose as if imprisoned. They have no souls. They have no e-ticket out. And that some of us have souls that can come in interact with the universe almost as if it were being, the other part is being taunted by the fact that if you lose your soul, you'll never get out of this universe and that some of us are in and we are recycling for a purpose that only the divine field knows. And those that are trapped here, we have a name for them. Of course, you know what it is. It's Demons, that's what we call them. And these dark entities, we have different names for them now. We call them various forms of alien, but they are all in the same situation. They trapped themselves here by ignoring the divine presence. Exactly. 
Thank you so much, Linda Moulton Howe. It's always a terrific experience to be with you on Dreamland. Her website is earthfiles.com. Don't miss it. And don't miss either one of us at Contact in the Desert. Very frankly, if there are two people who go out there in public with the real stuff and the real deal, it's me and it's Linda, and we are almost alone in that respect. <laughs> yes, absolutely, and uh, I look forward to shaking hands with everybody listening today, Whitley, and to seeing you again in the matter world. It's so much a pleasure, yes, because Linda has seen me in the non-physical before. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Linda. And thank you, Whitley. God bless. God bless. You've been listening to Dreamland. Be sure to tune in again next week. Dreamland is brought to you by UnknownCountry.com and its family of subscribers. Unknown Country was founded by Ann Streber. Our news editor is Matthew Frizzell. Our coordinator is Amy Safrankova. Whitley Streber is your Dreamland host. And I'm your announcer, Ted Alexander. Thank you for listening.